I want to show you, before I get into Acts chapter 8, I want to show you one verse uh, from Proverbs 11.30, and this is going to be kind of our theme, and I believe maybe for the next couple of weeks. Um, Stacy mentioned on Wednesday night, I was talking about you being able to lead people, other people who are searching for, for answers and searching for truth, leading them to Christ. I believe the church has to be prepared to lead people to Christ. You cannot depend on a pastor to always be there to lead somebody to Christ. Maybe in your family, maybe your children. You cannot always depend on a pastor to be there. You cannot always depend on um, uh, an elder or a godly uh, person in the church, a friend. You can't always depend on somebody else. If you are a Christian, I believe that you ought to know how to lead somebody to Christ. You ought to, you ought to be an expert on the subject of salvation. I believe every Christian should be that. And I want to show you Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, famous verse says this, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. That means that the fruit of a righteous person's life should be a tree that the branches going off that tree is somebody else's life, okay? That has been, have, has been impacted, affected, changed forever, for eternity by your life. The tree, uh, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. And notice this, and he that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls. He that winneth souls. Acts chapter number eight. Acts chapter eight. I want to tell you uh, a, a little story here, and I want to pull some truth out of this story. Acts chapter eight, and uh, beginning in verse number 26, we are going to meet a disciple of Jesus by the name of Philip, and we are going to see this is not too long after, within a year or two of the time that uh, Jesus uh, rose from the dead after his crucifixion. Notice this. Acts chapter number 8, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So here is Philip, and the Lord tells him to go out into the desert because there is a person out there. Uh, this Ethiopian eunuch, is, if you study the Bible, he worked for Candace, uh, the queen. He was in charge of her money, keeping up with her money and, and uh, in charge of the treasury. Now watch this, verse number 28. Was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. So here is this man from Ethiopia who works for Candace, who's in the area around uh, Jerusalem, and God sends Philip over to meet this, this Ethiopian eunuch, and this Ethiopian eunuch is sitting in his chariot reading Scripture, okay? He's reading the prophet Isaiah, okay, from the Old Testament. And here is what he's reading, verse number 9. This is the passage of, of, of Scripture. Well, there's another verse before we find out what he's reading. Verse number 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. He said, Philip, go up there and get in the chariot with this guy. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So Philip climbs up in the chariot with this guy, and he says, hey, I got a question. Do you understand what you're reading about? Isaiah, do you understand it? And here's what he says. He says, and he said, how can I, except some men should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. He said, hey, come up in here and sit with me, because how in the world am I supposed to understand what I'm reading unless somebody kind of walks me through it? He said, somebody needs to guide me. And here's what he was reading. He was reading. Uh, this verse, the place of the scripture, which he read was this. Okay. And this is a quote from the old Testament it comes from Isaiah 53, verse seven and eight. If you want to jot that in your notes, Isaiah 53, seven and eight, here's what he says. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer. So opened he not his mouth in his humiliation. His judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. 
This is Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus showed up on the earth, prophesying that Jesus is going to come, that he is going to walk to the cross, walk up Calvary's mountain. He's not going to open his mouth. He's not going to speak. He is going to be humbled and give his life as a sacrifice for many. And this Ethiopian is sitting in this chariot reading this story, but he doesn't get it. And he says, hey, Philip, come up and talk to me and tell me uh, what this means. Okay, next verse. He says this. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Who's he talking about? Of himself or of some other man? Is he talking about himself? Is he, is he, is he t t trying to tell a story that he went through or is he talking about somebody else? Now watch this. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. I love that. He opened, he started from Isaiah 53, and he opened the scripture, opened his mouth, and taught this man Jesus, preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Now I want you to understand something here. As soon as this guy got saved, as soon as, as, as he said, hey, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, he said, I want to get baptized. They went down into the water, got baptized, and as soon as they come up out of the water, the Bible says the Spirit of God caught Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. He vanished before his eyes. God took him away. Now, that's a miraculous thing, right? Miraculous thing, right? I've often said... Uh, it'd be kind of crazy if, if once, you know, uh, God has a plan for you after you get saved, right? Because uh, if he didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense? Like, you know, we're waiting for the Lord to come back and, and call us in the trumpet to sound. But what if once you got saved, you went straight to heaven? Wouldn't that be kind of weird? Because I'd give an altar call and somebody would raise their hand. I want to be saved. And then they just disappear. Wouldn't that be crazy? And then I'm wondering why I'm still here, right? <laughs> like, huh? okay, I don't get that. But no, this, this guy gets led to the Lord by Philip. And then Philip just disappears, and I love it. It says, and he went on his way rejoicing. He didn't let that bother him. He did, it was so excited that he had just gotten saved. This is a wonderful story of a person in the days and the, the brief years after Jesus uh, died and was buried and rose again, of somebody finding him and faith in Jesus, having their eternity shaped and changed forever by a follower of Jesus in the early days. And this man named Philip. I want to show you some things this morning that, that help you. Because remember, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. Your job and my job is to turn many to Jesus Christ. That is why we are here. That is why we have a church that is why we open our doors every Sunday, every Wednesday. That is why we do everything we do. It is to make Jesus famous, to lead people to salvation by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. That's, that's why we're here, okay? That is why we're here. We have youth ministry. We have uh, music. We have all of these things that are part of church. Everything that we do, though, supports this overwhelming, the, the underlying premise that we have of leading people to Jesus Christ. That this is to be our heartbeat. Church, this is to be our heartbeat. This is what we're here for, is to lead people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is what you, that's why you, as soon as you got saved, you didn't just go up to heaven. You were left here for a reason, and that reason was to impact somebody's life for Christ. And that is your job, and that is my job. It's not just a preacher's job, but it is also a layperson's job. It's also just a regular church member's job. It's also just a, a, a regular Christian. Hey, you can have an impact on somebody's life. Let me tell you something. You young folks, near into the end of school year, let me tell you something. Every person that sits in every class with you every day will spend eternity somewhere. Every 
And there's only two choices. There's only two places. It's either with God or separated from God. The Bible speaks of the lake of fire. The Bible speaks of heaven. The Bible doesn't speak of an in-between place. That's, there's just two places. And there's only one way to get to the good place, and that's through Jesus Christ. And if you know that, how selfish is that for me to keep that truth inside of me and not share it with the world? That's why Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You're a city set on a hill, and you are not to be hid. You are not to light a candle and, and, and put it under a bushel, right? You remember the old song, light it, hide it under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. You and I, we are to use our mouths to lead people to Christ. I, we are to use our lives to lead people to Christ. There are times that God is going to have us talk to people directly and lead them to Christ. Friends and coworkers and family members and people that you meet along your life's way. There's also going to be people who are going to see your life and say, hey, I want to be a Christian because of how that person lives their life. I want the God that they have. And that should, be, that should spur us every day to be better because people are watching. People are always watching you. Moses learned that the hard way. Moses learned that always people are watching, right? When he killed the guy and hit him in the sand and thought nobody saw it. But somebody did see it. You see, you and I are turning people to Jesus or away from Jesus every day by how we live our life. Our lives are to lead people to Christ. And so are our mouths. But I want to show you in this story that I just told you just four quick things this morning. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, Philip, if you look at verse number 26 again, the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Verse 26. Can we get back there real quick? He says, The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. You just sang about a go. Right? It's kind of weird. Okay? He said, the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Go, arise and go toward the south, under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Why is God telling him to go? Because there is somebody down there that needs Philip. And let me tell you this. I want everybody to listen to me. Point number one is this. Somebody out there needs you. Did you know that? Somebody out there needs you. Somebody out there is waiting to cross your path. And can I tell you something? When you live close to God, God takes care and orders your steps and brings you across the path of the people that he wants you to impact with the gospel. That he wants you to impact with his love. God is pulling the strings behind the scenes. And we see that in this passage. He says, hey, Philip. I want you to go down out into the desert, go to a specific place because somebody is waiting on you. I got a question for you this morning. Who's waiting on you? Somebody out there is waiting on you. Hey, young folks, somebody out there at your school is waiting on you to be the witness, to be the mouthpiece, to get them to Jesus Christ. Amen? Somebody at your work is waiting on you to be the voice of spirituality, to be the voice of love, to be the voice of grace, to be the voice of mercy, to be the voice that gives them Jesus Christ. Somebody's waiting on you. Somebody's waiting on me. Somebody out there needs you this morning. Did you know that? Somebody out there needs you. Who is it? Who is it? Is it your husband? Does your husband need you this morning? Maybe your husband's unsaved. Maybe he's not here with you this morning. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe you're here by yourself and your wife's not here. And your wife needs you this morning. Maybe you have a child that's off at college and, and has never expressed faith in Christ. They need you this morning. They need you to be the prayer warrior. They need you to be the mouthpiece of Jesus into their life. They need you today. Tomorrow morning you're going to go to work and there may be a boss, there may be a, a co-worker that needs you. They need you to pray with them. They need you to tell them how to be saved. They need you to be Jesus Christ in their life. 
And the scary thought is, if Philip hadn't been obedient and went to this Ethiopian eunuch, would that Ethiopian eunuch have been saved? Let me tell you something. You cannot always have a preacher on call to talk to your friends and loved ones. You can't do it. You're going to have to step up and be the mouthpiece in your life. Because God's got people that he wants me to lead to Christ, but he's also got people he wants you to lead to Christ. Let me ask you something. Who's waiting on you? Somebody's out there waiting on you. Somebody was out there waiting on Philip, and God had a plan. Psalm 37, verse 23, says this. Psalm 37, 23, says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. You know what that means? That means that when you are close to God, God orders your steps and has a plan and brings people across your path for specific reasons. Are you, are you tracking with me? He brings people across your path for specific reasons. Why? Because when you're close to the Lord, he orders your steps. He orders your steps. When I was a little boy, I had a preacher and he would always say this. He said, every day when I get up, he said, I pray this prayer. Lord, help me today as I walk in these shoes to cross the path of the people that you would help if you were walking in these shoes today. I yield to you my hands. I yield to you my feet. I yield to you my mouth. Why? Because somebody's out there waiting for you. Somebody's out there waiting for you. Let me tell you something. I don't think, I don't think that many of us grasp how much people need us. I don't think we grasp how fragile life is. Do you understand me? Do you understand that life can be here today and it can be gone tomorrow? You may think that you have years and years and years to talk to that brother of yours that's lost and unsaved, but let me tell you something. You do not know that you have years and years and years and years. Things happen, right? Accidents happen. Cancer happens. Life happens. Things happen that alter that time frame that you think you have. I want to tell you today, I want to compel you. I want to beg you to be a soul winner. He that winneth souls is wise. And somebody out there is waiting for you. Somebody out there, maybe you're not close to them. Maybe they're not a family member. But you should always be looking for somebody that is hungry for what you have on the inside of you. You should look for ways to get into conversation about the Lord, about church, about things like of that nature, and, and if you can, about salvation. I always watch, and man, sometimes you talk to people, and over the last couple of weeks, I've gotten a chance to, to talk to a couple of people who um, you didn't know if they were saved. And sometimes you talk to people and you can pick up right off, they are not listening to what you're saying. The Bible calls that kind of hard ground, okay? It's not freshly plowed ground ready for seeding. It's kind of that hard, crusty ground, okay? And let me tell you something. There's been many times in my life where I'm, I'm not good ground, right? I'm hard and crusty, all right? How many got a husband this morning that's just all hard and crusty, right? All right? And, and we're just not good ground, Okay, but let me tell you something. There are people that you talk to, and if you'll look for it, they're the, they're, the, they're the person that just lost mama or dad. They're the person that just got a bad doctor's report. They're the, the lady that you work with, that the tears running down her eyes. You know she's having a rough day. Let me tell you something. When you see heartbreak and you see a, a, a tender heart, let me tell you something. That is a great time for you to speak up on behalf of Jesus Christ. Speak up. On behalf of Jesus Christ. Why? Because somebody out there needs you. Number two. Soul winners are guides on the way to Jesus. Look at verse number 31. Chapter 8 of Acts verse 31. The Bible says. When Isaiah or when Philip asked him. He said do you understand what you're reading? He said how can I. Watch this. How can I except some man should guide me. Let me tell you something. 
A soul winner is a guide. Did you know that? That's what we are. Now, let me be, okay, I'm known for this. Let me, be a, let me poke a, a little bit, okay, at our traditions and the way we do things, okay? As a pastor, I'm going to give, I will not preach a, a sermon, especially on a Sunday morning, without giving an opportunity for people to be saved. I, I don't, I, that just goes against everything. I, I don't want to stand up here and tell people how to be saved and then not give, an, not give them an opportunity to respond, okay? I grew up in a Baptist church, and we call that an invitation, right? You give an invitation, you preach a message, and give an invitation to respond to that message, whether it's coming to an altar or raising a hand or whatever. I, I, I want to always do that. I don't want to just give somebody the truth and then walk them right up to it and not give them an opportunity to respond. That's not what I want to do. But you are a guide. I cannot twist your arm and make you get saved. I've seen preachers do that. I've seen some crazy stuff. Oh, Ray, uh, hey, there's somebody here. God just told me somebody in this, this crowd right here that needs to be saved this morning. And guess what? We're not turning church out until you get saved, all right? I've, I've seen that kind of tactic, right? I've seen them turn up the heat to make it uncomfortable to kind of get you to move, right? I, I've seen that, okay? I've seen this. Choir. Sing another verse of just as I am. How many have ever seen that? Sing another verse of this song, that verse. Why? Because we got to flush them out. We got to like smoke them out like cockroaches, okay? Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter how many verses of a song you sing an invitation. When it comes down, I am a guide. I can tell you how to be saved. But can I tell you something? You have to make the decision. I will always give you an opportunity to respond. But you have to respond. The verse that we just, d- just read that Stacy gave us, okay? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart, thou shalt be saved. Can I tell you something, guys? We, I cannot make you get saved. Can I tell you what doesn't save you? The prayer doesn't save you. Can I tell you what doesn't save you? Raising your hand doesn't save you. Can I tell you what doesn't save you? Walking down an aisle in a revival meeting or a youth meeting, walking down to the front, that didn't save you. I can't tell you how many people I've led to the Lord in my life of adults who thought they were saved when they were a teenager because they went to a youth meeting or something. Somebody grabbed their hand and said, come down to the front with me. And they led them down to the front and they said, well, I I said what the preacher said. I, I prayed the prayer. But later on, they really got saved because the prayer is not what saved you. Do you understand that the heart is involved? Are you, are you, you understand? What am I? What are you? We are guides, right? I can't twist your arm and make you get saved, but I can lead you to it. And I can say, you know what? It's not really that hard if you believe and you confess that Jesus is the Lord and you want him to save you and invite him in and you mean it in your heart, he will save you. What is that? I'm guiding them, right? I'm guiding them. You're leading them through the paths, right? You're leading them through the paths. Same thing if you, uh, you know, if you go fishing and get a guide to take you to the good spots. Or you go on a hunting trip, you get a guide to take you where you need to go. That's what you are. You are, as a soul winner, a guide. You understand what you're reading in Isaiah? No. How can I unless somebody guides me? Number three. Number three. Three of 14. Here we go. Uh, Just seeing if y'all are awake. Number three. Actually, I just gave you number three. That was number three. I skipped number two. I don't know why. I looked at my notes wrong. Okay? I want you to look back at verse number 27. I'll give you number two here. Okay? Verse number 27. Watch this. And he arose and went. When God told him to go down and find the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip got up and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, eunuch, under authority from Candace the queen. Now watch this. Verse number 29. Skip down to verse number 29. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. So when he gets down there, he sees the chariot and the, and the eunuch is in the chariot. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to Philip's heart. And he says, hey, I want you to go over there and get in the chariot with the man, right? And what do we see here? And this is, this is number two. And I want to uh, read it how I wrote it down in my study. Sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit 
is required to find those people looking for Christ. You've got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me tell you something. This is, I believe, one of the key problems with us as Christians. We're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. I heard a preacher say not too long ago, he said, we're not full of God because we're too full of ourselves. He said, if we will empty ourselves of ourselves, then we are an empty vessel that can be filled by God. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit of God. Guys, listen to this. Sensitivity. That voice that tells you that you need to do something. I'm not talking about your conscience. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you know as a Christian the voice of God. If you've been saved, you know the voice of God. And you know when God tells you to do something. When God tells you to talk to somebody. When God compels you and you are compelled. Let me tell you something. I've had this question from my kids. Well, what does God, they, they've both been saved, but I've had this question. Well, how do I know when God's speaking to me about things? And I... As a pastor, here's my big scientific theological answer. When God speaks, you'll know. I always like the fiery furnace story. When they throw three of them in the fiery furnace, right? And then he looks down in there and he goes, I thought we threw three in, didn't we? And they're like, yeah. He goes, I see four and the fourth one looks like the son of God. Has he ever seen the son of God before? No, but when you see him, you'll know, right? Okay, and that's how they did with Jesus. They were just blown away at his teaching during his ministry. When you come across the path of God, when you hear God's voice, you know. When I was sitting in that balcony at nine years old, I had been saved for a couple years, and God touched my heart and said, at nine years old, Brandon, I want you to spend your life preaching the gospel. I didn't have to say, who is this again? You know, I didn't have to do that. I knew who it was. And I want you to understand something. I believe you know the voice of God. And I believe if you will turn down the volume of life and ask God to speak to you and then listen for his answer, he will show you. It goes back to my preacher saying, hey, let me today in these shoes cross the path of the people that you would help if you walked in these shoes, Lord. Show me those people. Let, let me see them. You want to pray a dangerous prayer? I challenge you to pray this. Lord, bring people across my path that need Jesus need the truth and I promise you I'll give it to him you pray that prayer and you better watch out mm -hmm. right because why because God's going to start bringing people across your path maybe even as quick as today you, somebody's going to come across your path and you're going to have the discernment to start seeing what the Holy Spirit's been trying to show you the whole time but the volumes turned up too much in your life and you can't hear his voice you know what there's a verse in the Old Testament and it says this that God doesn't want to be, and he's talking about Israel. He says, God doesn't want to be to Israel as a roaring lion. He wants to be as a moth. And that always, like, I was like, well, that's kind of weird. He, wants to, he doesn't want to be a roaring lion to Israel. He wants to be a moth, right? I got up yesterday morning at the house, okay? And there were moths all over my house. The door had been open. We've been out on the porch. And uh, the door was open, okay? And there's moss all over the house, right? You got four, and you're like, where are all these stinking moths? And you know what a moth does? It doesn't roar like a lion, does it? You see a moth out of the corner of your eye, and it's over there in the corner. It's just flying around. God says, I don't want to be to Israel as a roaring lion. I don't want to always have to roar to get your attention. I want you to be watching for me and listening to me and catch me out of the corner of your eye like you would a moth and say, hey, that's God and that's the direction God wants us to go. I am going to be led by the Spirit of God. That's what Philip said. He said, I want you to go out into the desert. Yes, sir, I'm going. He gets over there. He says, hey, son, I think you ought to go to that chariot over there. Okay, I'm going. He was obedient and he was watching and discerning and listening for the Spirit of God. You teenagers. You adults, let me tell you something, even not in the area of being a soul winner, but in the area of just listening to the voice of God, if you'll ask God to speak to you, Lord, when I get close to something I shouldn't, speak to me. Lord, when I am supposed to take a right turn, show me. 
Be my guide. Be my GPS. I want to listen. If you'll pray that prayer every morning of your life and then walk through life with your ears alert, I promise you, I promise you, God will speak to you. You, He's trying to speak to you now. What does Jesus say over and over in Scripture? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Do I have ears to hear? I was about 16 years old. I told this story not too long ago, I think on a Wednesday. I was about 16 years old. I was working at Pag's Pizza. Guess what I was? <clears throat> I started as a dishwasher, all right? I hated that job. I, I, I'm like, I don't want to touch people's food after they've eaten it, okay? So I had to work my way out of that. So I worked my way up to cook, right? All right, so now I'm a cook. And uh, I, I had to go in. And uh, I worked a lot of weekends and things like that, uh, or Saturday weren't open on Sunday. And, uh, but I would go in and, and, and prep, and we'd slice the tomatoes and, do, you know, cut this, cut that. We made, uh, you know, there were spaghetti, was spaghetti, things like that, uh, 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 pizza, all kinds of things. You had to prep all that stuff, okay? Get the whole, whole bar ready there, right? And I was down there, and, and it was early in the morning, and there was a guy that I worked with. His name was John. I, I, I never will forget John. Worked with him for two or three years. And uh, this Saturday morning, I went in and I started prepping. And then when I was in there, I knew that I had to, we didn't open until 11 o'clock, just open for lunch, right? So, and this was like 8 o'clock in the morning. It took two or three hours to get it done. So it's just going to be me and John for a good two, two and a half hours. And then I heard something. I didn't hear it. I felt it more than I heard it. But it was a little voice in my, in my heart. And it said, I want you to talk to John today about his salvation. And I remember saying, ah, today's not good for me. <laughs> I remember saying that. I'm like, no, I don't want to talk to John. Like, how, do, how does that even start? What do you even do there, right? I want to talk to John. What do you want me to do? Hey, John, you, would you like me to tell you how to be saved? I mean, how did, that's weird. You can't do that. And I remember going downstairs, and I remember putting God off. You ever put God off? I did it. Okay, here we go, right? I'm like, God, I don't want to do that. I'm nervous. Not, no, 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 no. I don't, no, I can't do that. I was down there slicing tomatoes on the slicer. And I'm down there, and there's John. God's Holy Spirit just speaks to my heart. Talk to him. I want you to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. I'm, have you ever had this conversation? I don't, I don't want to. It's like you're bickering with your wife, but it's not your wife. It's God. It's like, I don't want to. Okay. All right? You ever, like, ignore God? And it's like, I didn't hear anything. What? 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 No. Yeah, I played all those games with God, right? And he's like, Brandon, I told I want you to do this. <sighs> I'm sitting there, and I'm wrestling with God. And then finally, I said, okay, this is going to sound so corny. I said, hey, John, how are you? You know, we're talking. We've been talking, but not about spiritual stuff. I don't want to get near that. And I said, John, let me ask you something. Here's, what, here's how I started. I said, do you go to church anywhere? No, okay, let's go. He goes, ah, uh, he said, I used to. He goes, I used to, hadn't been going, you know, much. He was newly married, new, new baby. And he said, no, I hadn't been going, going too much, but used to when I was younger. And then God just opened my eyes, and here's, here's what I said next. I said, John, it's not really about going to church. I said, I said this may be a weird question. That's kind of how I said it. I said, I want to ask you something. More important than going to church to church is knowing in your heart that your sins have been forgiven and that you're going to go to heaven when you die. I said, do you know that? And I never will forget as a 17 year old boy, I looked at John and I saw John and I saw the tears well up in his eyes. And he said, no, I don't know that. But I sure would like to. And I remember in the basement of Pag's Pizza, I told John how to be saved. And in the basement of Pag's Pizza, John bowed his head right there and he said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sin and take me to heaven one day when I die. I don't work at Pag's Pizza anymore. Y'all didn't know that. I don't. That's 20, year, you know, 20 years ago. But guess what? I don't know where John is today. I was in his life for a couple years. That's it. 
But God spoke, and that's always the example that jumps out to me because of the wrestling match that I had with God. And I thank God for John's sake. And who knows how many others in John's life that will be in heaven forever because I listened to the Spirit of God. I wish I had a thousand stories like that to tell you. I've, I've led a lot of people to the Lord, but that one always jumps out because of, of the, the, the back and forth that I had with God. And you guys, you're going to be in that situation. And you're going to have to talk to your mom and your dad and your uncle and your brother. Because let me tell you something, especially if you've got an uh, elderly parent or uncle or aunt, man, you need to have these conversations. You need to be the voice. You need to be the light. You need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Lastly, number four. In verse number 35, G, G, uh, Philip says this. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Philip started in Isaiah 53. Why? Because that's where the Ethiopian eunuch was. He was reading in 53, so he started telling him, hey, this is what it says in that verse. And it's talking about Jesus. Let me back up. Okay. Let me, let me bounce over here to chapter 63. Let me, let me, and he started bouncing around and took him from the Old Testament and preached to him Jesus. Can I tell you something? Listen to me. If you are going to lead people to Christ, you've got to know how to tell somebody to be saved. But you know what you also got to know? You got to know your Bible. See, y'all think that I tell you read your Bible. For your benefit. What if I'm telling you to read your Bible every day of your life for somebody down the road's benefit that you're going to lead to Christ because you're going to remember a passage of Scripture and use that to lead them to Christ? That's why I tell you to be here on Wednesday night. Because let me tell you something. On Wednesday night, most of our crowd, okay, most of our crowd saved, baptized on Wednesday night. On Sunday morning, okay, if you're going to go to a new church, that's the day you go, right? You might have never gone to church. We have people routinely. I've never been to church. I've been out of church for years. I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I don't know I'm saved. You have a, a variety of people on Sunday morning. I don't get way deep on Sunday morning like teaching you. Uh, we, 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 we take simple truths and try to highlight them on Sunday morning. Let me tell you something. On Wednesday night, that's why I'm always like, hey, come out here because we're going to dig deep. You're going to learn your Bible. This is discipleship and learning this precious book that God's given us to learn. Why? So you can learn it well enough to be able to talk to people that are seeking truth. That's what we're doing. That's why I want you to come on Wednesday night. That's why I want you to read your Bible. Hebrews says it this way. Hebrews says this. Chapter number 5, verse number 12. Look at this. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again. That's a pretty rough verse. Paul says in Hebrews, I believe it's Paul, he says, you're supposed to be teaching others right now, but i got to come back and hit and reteach you because you've forgotten. Which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Watch this. And to become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Basically, he's calling them babies there, okay? You need a bottle and not a steak, right? That's what he's saying. In the next verse, he says this. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word. Notice that. What's he saying? He's saying if you need milk and you need to be taught again all the time and you don't, it doesn't sink in and you don't learn it, you're unskillful in the word, you're like a baby. But watch what he says. For he is a babe. But what, uh, verse number 14, last verse, he says, but strong meat or the steak belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know what happens when you get skillful in the word, you use the word. It's like a muscle that builds up and you can do more. You can discern more. You are led by the spirit more. Why? Because you are in the Word, the Word is what makes you a mature Christian or not. See, some people think, I've been saved for 30 years. I'm a, I'm a good Christian. I'm a strong Christian. You may not be. I've been a member of a church for 45 years. I'm a good Christian. You may not be. How skillful are you in the Word? We may have some babies who need a bottle that have been saved for 30 years. Amen? Maybe it's me. Maybe it's you. We need to get skillful in the Word. Okay? So I want you to understand this. 
Understand this. I said, number one, somebody out there needs you. Number two, sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit is required to find those people. Number three, soul winners are guides on the way to Jesus. And number four, you can preach Jesus and know that from any place in Scripture. Did you know that every page in this book, you can preach Jesus? Did you know one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible is Genesis chapter 5? You know what it is? It's a bunch of names. It's a genealogy. I'm a dork, okay? I love that stuff. Did you know that if you take Genesis chapter 5 and there's 10 generations from Adam to the flood, if you take those generations and break them down and look at like Noah and Lamech and Methuselah and you find out the meaning of their names, do you know it basically says, and I'm paraphrasing, if you just take their names and put them in order and just read it, that man is fallen but God is going to send somebody to rescue them. That's what it says, in the meaning of their names. You can take any page of this book and preach Jesus. You know why? I've heard people say this all my life, and it makes me cringe because it's so sad. People say, well, we just need to focus on the New Testament because the Old Testament's outdated. No, the Old Testament, okay, the Old Testament is there to teach you and show you how to understand the New Testament. And the New Testament is what the Old Testament was always talking about, okay? Okay. The, I, I'm trying to remember how, how it said it. I, I saw a quote not too long ago. It said the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Okay? It fits together. Don't let anybody ever tell you. I heard I had a guy one time tell me. He said, Brandon, I, I wish you wouldn't preach out of that old Bible. I wish you'd preach out of that new Bible. I said, what do you mean? He said, that Old Testament, that's all gone. No, 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 no. It's there for our instruction. Let me tell you something. If you're going to teach somebody how to go to heaven, here's what they need to know. Write this down, and I'm done. They need to know, number one, that they're a sinner. Right? Romans 3.10 says this. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you know that to be saved, you first have to be lost? I've talked to people before, sadly, in my life, and I can't, I can't lead them to Christ because I can't get them lost. They think they do no wrong. I've, I, have you ever sinned? No, I've never sinned. Really? Right? Man, I can't make it through a day. They've made it through their whole life, right? Okay? It's like, man, you are good, right? No, the truth of the matter is you've, all, you've fallen short whether you admit it or not. But the first step is that you have to admit that you've fallen short, right? You can't be saved unless you admit that you need to be saved, right? Okay? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then the second thing they have to understand, yes, you're a sinner. Number two is that there's a penalty on sin. Romans 6.23 says this, for the wages of sin is death. That's what you earned. If you get in your car, pull out of this parking lot, go 100 miles an hour down by the fairgrounds, guess what? You're probably going to get a ticket. You know why? Because you earned a ticket. The wages of your sin is that ticket. The wages of your sin against God is death. It means separation. In Revelation, it says the lake of fire is the second death. That, that's what you earn. You know what I earned? I earned death. Separation from God forever. But man, and I, I love telling people this because at this point, I always tell them, you're a sinner. You deserve separation from God forever. But guess what? I'm glad the story doesn't end there, and I'm glad that verse doesn't end there. One of my favorite words in all the Bible is this one right here. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's got a gift all wrapped up, and he's holding it out to you, and he's saying, I got a gift for you. You don't deserve it, but this gift is eternal life, but it's only through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross so you didn't have to die for your sins. He paid your sin debt. He went to the grave. He rose again. Why? In victory over that sin. And if you will believe that he did that for you and you'll put your faith and your trust in him, you will be saved. Every person in this room has faith. Do you know that? Every person has faith in here. It's just 
What's your faith in? My faith is in Jesus Christ and the God of this Bible to save my soul. If he lied to me, then I guess I, I missed it, right? What's your faith in? Is your faith in, an, in another religion? Is your faith in no religion? I'm an atheist. I don't believe in anything. You know what you did? You invested your faith in being an atheist. Somebody told you there was no God and you, you, you played into it. And, and, and hey, I can't twist your arm and make you believe in God, but you have faith and you invested it. I, have, I invested my faith in something different, but you have faith. To every man is given a measure of faith, the Bible says. What are you going to invest it in? If you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin and he's holding out a gift for you, I always tell people, would you want to accept Christ if he'll forgive you of your sin and save you? Wouldn't you like for that to be done? And you know what? I don't think I've ever had anybody say, no. If Jesus would forgive you of all your sin, wash you clean, and save your soul, and one day you get to go to heaven, and all you got to do is believe in him, what, what, isn't that a pretty good deal? Well, how do you do that? Romans chapter 10, verse 23, here's what it says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When I, when I talk to people and lead people to Christ, I always put their, not always, but a lot of times I'll put their name in there. My name. For if Brandon shall call upon the name of the Lord, Brandon shall be saved. For if Catherine shall call upon the name of the Lord, Catherine shall be saved. Let me tell you something. I said earlier it's not the prayer that saves you, and it's not. But when you believe with your heart and you call on the Lord, the Bible says, all who come to him he will in no wise cast out. Now listen to me. Listen to me. I want to show you something right here. I've got a checkbook here. Who wants a check? <laughs> no. I've got a checkbook here. Grab this out of the drawer at the house. If I were to take a check and I were to write you a check, okay? I'm going to write Ken a check. Ken, I'm going to write you a check for $100 and I'm going to sign that check and I'm going to give that check to Ken. Have I given him the $100? Yeah. I'm holding out the $100, right? He reaches out and takes the $100. Do you know, though, that he will not have $100 until he goes to the bank and cashes that check? The reason I tell you that is this. I talk to a lot of people, and here's what they say. Oh, I've heard about Jesus all my life. I've gone to church. I believe he's the son of God. I, yeah, I believe that. Okay? Have you, and then here's what I always ask them. Do you remember a time in your life when you personally accepted Christ into your heart? Not just you've gone to church and heard it all your life. I, I, here, here's what I've heard a couple times too. I've always been a Christian. Okay? Because that's how you're, I was raised and, and I've never known a time not going to church or whatever. But you haven't always been a Christian. There has to be a time in your life where you said yes to Christ and not only had the check, but you cashed the check. Does that make sense? So I ask you this today in closing. Have you ever cashed the check? Have you ever received from God's hand the gift of eternal life and said, yes, I need to be saved? And secondly, I want to ask you this. Who's that somebody out there that's waiting for you? On your way out today, there's little catalyst cards out there to invite people to come to church. You know, on the back of that card is that Romans road that I just gave you. And you can give that card and not only invite somebody to church, but you can do like I did with John. More important than going to church is knowing for sure you're going to heaven. And you can walk them through that. Somebody's waiting on you. Are you going to be obedient, sensitive to the Spirit, and reach out to them? Father, I come to you today, and I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this time that we can spend together. And Lord, thank you for the story of Philip and his obedience to you. And I pray, Lord, right now that you will just speak to our hearts and to this crowd. And may we, Lord, this morning be sensitive to the fact that we are to be soul winners and that there are people out there that need us. And I and all of us are to be sensitive to that fact and looking for people to impact. And Lord, I think that would change our lives if we got our focus off of us and our problems and our worries and just started looking for people that need Jesus. 
How would that change my life? I think it would change it drastically. Lord, I ask you now to help us. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. This is that invitation part. If you're here today and you say, Brandon, I do not know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I would love to make today the day that I accept Christ into my heart and make this my personal moment of accepting him. I believe in him, and I want to personally accept him and cash that check that he bought and paid for with his life. If you're here today and you say, Brandon, that's me. I'm not, I don't know that I'm saved. Would you just slip up your hand? Nobody's looking around, just me. Would you just slip up your hand, Brandon? I'm not sure that I'm saved. I see that hand. Thank you, young man. Who else? I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure that I've ever had a time in my life that I've accepted Christ as my Savior. Anybody else? To the one that raised their hand, I ask you this. Do you admit that you're a sinner? Do you believe that you owe the penalty of sin, which is separation from God forever? But do you believe that Jesus died on the cross to save you from that sin, save you from that penalty by his grace and his mercy? Do you believe he died on the cross, rose again from the dead, and he did it for you? If you believe that, I want you to pray this prayer to him, mean it from your heart. I want you to say this right now. Dear Jesus, I need to be saved. I believe in you. I believe you are the son of God. I know I'm a sinner. I know I owe the penalty of sin, which is death and hell. But I believe you died for me on the cross. I believe you, ra you were raised from the dead three days later. And right now, today, I invite you to come into my heart. Wash me clean from my sin. Save my soul. Be my Savior. I accept you. Thank you for saving me. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, the Bible says you were not rejected by Christ. He, re he, be he received your humble admission and he gave you mercy and grace. If you prayed that prayer this morning, I want you to raise your hand. Brandon, I prayed that prayer and I accepted Christ as my Savior. Anybody like that? I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. This morning, Lastly, if you're sitting here this morning, say, Brandon, my prayer today is that when I walk out of here, that I'll be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God and that I will be open and looking for the people that God wants me as a Christian to help. And I pray that I'll help them. If you'll join me in praying that, would you just lift your hand? Father, empower us now as we leave this place. You see, church isn't this building. The people in this building are the church. And as we leave now, the church leaves this building to go be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, as we go. Help us and bring those people across our path that we need to help. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.